probably the first year in a long time where we have the the rider and the the, the route Giro Tour and the world um which which will suit one rider which is we which we will be um, Pogacar. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, and with me is Matt Hansen. Welcome, Matt. Very excited for today's podcast. Oh, I bet you are. I bet you are. The The feature interview is, tell us. Stephen Roach. Stephen Roach. He is one of two riders, only two, to snag road cycling's triple crown. That's winning the Giro d'Italia, the Tour de France, and the World Championships in one year. You remember it well, don't you? You know, I don't actually know if I was I was watching racing because so I was a little a little kid, but uh, I definitely have since watched some of those, uh, you know, amazing stages in the Tour and the Giro, and obviously the when he won the Worlds. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, when you think about how special it is, because given that only one other fella did it, who was pretty good himself, um, Mr. Eddie Merckx. Uh, it's, you know, in the 100 years or whatever of cycling it's been, uh, it's pretty incredible. It is incredible. And we get into Stephen Roach's 1987 year of incredible racing. But we don't just hear great stories from the past, even though he's a fantastic storyteller and you could just, I could just listen to him all day. But we also get his insights into what could be, what could happen this season. Could Tade Pogachar match Roach and Eddie Merckx by taking the Triple Crown. I've seen, following Liège Baston Liège, a proliferation of stories about, oh, the, the Giro Tour double. But jam that. Let's go for broke. Can he do the triple? But first, before the feature interview with Stephen Roach, Matt, it's been a few days since I've been to the office and I'm actually a little worried about the condition of my desk. Uh, I think the last time I was there, there was a mug with your FTP taped to it. Um, and I can only imagine how many printouts and uh, things are littering my desk with. No, I updated it. It went up a couple days after that. So I had to do another one. So I got you a new mug. That's great. I'm glad you're you know looking out for my desk. You've put that uh, DI2 cable back, right? Yeah, I'll see it there tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. I can't wait. Let's talk Liège, Baston Liège, Femme. That was a good race. I might even say, and I think I've said this about other spring classics, that the women's race tends to have a more exciting finale than the men's race of late. Especially when the winner almost crashed. <laughs> I know. Okay, I was going to get into that. Uh, right. So with about uh, 6.8 kilometers to go, there's a group of about six who are away, which includes Grace Brown of FDJ Suez. And uh, she locks it up in a corner. Uh, the rear comes up off the ground. It looks like she was going to biff it large. But uh, she pulled out of it. And then, to be honest, I was thinking, oh, okay, this is going to be the Demi Vollering, Kashin Yamadoma, and Elisa Longo Borghini show. And it was looking like that right into the closing meters, right? Uh, it was a long sprint there, a long final kilometer. Well, that's you know? right. Nievadoma Nye went early, or fairly early, and then started to fade. And then Elisa Longo Borghini starts coming around. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, you know, that's the Flanders winner is going to have a nice end of the spring. But uh, then, wham! Grace Brown. She started her sprint from, like, fourth or third back. And, uh, yeah, that was amazing. Probably the adrenaline from the almost crash, you know, just gave her that little edge. <laughs> but I thought New Adama went really early, even though, I mean, it's easy, of course, when you watch on TV. But, uh, but yeah, then you could see immediately you could see the sense of regret because she probably was like okay this is a long way to go also nieva doma had her teammate there elise chabby and they were doing the, the you know bouncing off one another sending one up ahead so i thought oh this could work this could work but uh no well played by grace brown for sure um the men's race liege baston liege um 
I mean, I don't mean to sound blasé. I hate to sound blasé about Tadej Pogacar's win. But there you go. It was uh, it was a win. Uh, 35 kilometers solo for him, and he takes it. It was stunning. It was masterful. It was dominant. And uh, it just doesn't make such a great retelling afterwards, I find. I think the fact that he dedicated to his fiance's mother, Erska Ziegert's uh, mother, was pretty pretty incredible. Um, that was, you know, you never see him super emotional in the end. I mean, not like that. You'll see him happy, but you could see. I was trying to figure out what was going on because he seemed kind of different, you know, at the end. Like his 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 celebration was sort of subdued. Um, and then he starts pointing to the sky. And you know, like, oh, hold on, why is he pointing to the sky? And then, of course, you know, he said later that it was to his fiance's uh, mother who died two years ago. Fair enough. That is a story. Uh, It's not the racing story exactly. It's not the play-by-play, but uh, it does add a whole other dimension to his win that... I know what you mean. As soon as as Carapaz couldn't hold the wheel, you're like, well, okay, I guess that's it, (laughs) you know? But you were worried about something else, weren't you? Because you're so selfish. (laughs) It's all about you. I was stressed about that race because uh, this whole podcast... This whole chat with Stephen Roach is predicated on, well, Tadej Pogacar making it out of this race okay. He didn't have to win. He just didn't, he couldn't crash. Because if he crashed, that would, as we saw last year at Liege, it, the repercussions of an accident, of a crash, just go on for weeks and months. And so this whole podcast was recorded last week, and I, I... Placed a bet. I placed a big bet that Tadej Pogacar was going to be okay, at the very least, at the end of Liège-Bastogne-Liège. If he wasn't okay, then, well, I'd have to have a plan B for this podcast. Anyway, that's too much about me. Enough about me. Let's talk about Jen Jackson. Switch to mountain biking, shall we? She, what a year she's having, and it's, all, it's only April. Exactly. It's pretty early. And she was racing recently at the World Cup in Arasha, Brazil. Uh, In the short track event, she was fifth, which was stellar. And then, holy jumping, the XCO race. She was leading right off the gun. And throughout the first half of the race, it was pretty exciting to watch her in the lead group. She would be third, she'd be seventh, she'd be up again, maybe around fourth on a very demanding course. It was kind of bonkers uh, some of the features there those rocks the rocks the the roots which are basically logs uh, that they had to go over uh, it was yeah a great course very exciting to watch and very exciting to watch Jen Jackson but then tragedy struck uh, she uh, she cracked her rim and uh, she wrote about it in a social media post on a tech descent Uh, She landed deep into the rocks, and uh, what she didn't consider uh, as a risk in pre-ride ended up cracking her rim. She, uh, in her post, she was kind of pretty hard on herself, actually. But uh, she does acknowledge it's one of her best World Cup results ever. Uh, She rolled in, rolled in. Uh, She did a wheel change and then was able to finish in 17th, which is stellar. I mean, it's heartbreak after being in the top seven, but uh, it's still a fantastic ride for Yeah. Jackson. Cycling can be cruel. There you go. Um, Actually, I'm going to read what Terry, mountain bike editor Terry McCall, wrote on uh, the website for his story. Jackson Wood, with a fresh wheel, finished 17th. While the result is good, it is more exciting seeing Jackson look so comfortable and solid riding among the world's best for so much of the race. It is only the second World Cup of a long season, It will be exciting to see what the Canadian champ can do when the series resumes in Nova Mesto, Czech Republic. And I agree with Terry wholeheartedly there. Yeah, our confidence is going to be even higher the next time. So that's good. This episode of the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast is supported by MS Bike. The first MS Bike events are coming soon. In June, there's the Couch and Valley Ride in BC, in Alberta, there's Airdrie to Olds as well as Leduc to Camrose. On our website, we have an eight-week training plan to help you get ready. And there's just enough time for those riders who are headed to one of those Alberta events. These are all top-level rides. 
They're fully supported with food, drinks, roadside support, and first aid. It's a great day out, and all for a good cause. For your fundraising efforts, you can get some pretty cool kit. There's a link in the show notes that you can check out. If you haven't already signed up for MS Bike, you should right now. Did you know that one in 400 Canadians lives with MS? You can help. Give your riding some focus and some purpose. Head to msbike.ca. Register and start fundraising. So Matt, let us look to the feature interview with Stephen Roach. I spoke with him, as I mentioned, just last week. He called me from his backyard uh, in France. His, um, he was burning data. His Wi-Fi was down. You know, that's always the case when you line things up. Something's bound to go boink. Maybe that's the disaster. The Wi-Fi being down for my talk with Stephen Roach instead of Pogachar crashing at LBL. You got to take a hit somewhere. That, that means that means he couldn't see the Carrera jacket I gave you to wear during the interview. <laughs> You're right, your vintage Carrera jacket that I was supposed yeah. to wear. You wore it, right? Yeah. Okay. As I mentioned, Roach is a great storyteller. Uh, he gets uh, into the Giro of '87 and kind of what a mess it was. It was so complicated. I think, you know, partly because of some of Roach's actions and also those of Roberto Vizzantini, his teammate. There was conflict within Carrera. Go figure, riding for an Italian team in an Italian tour and you're Irish and you start winning, you know, maybe wasn't so popular with everyone on the team or the country. He gets into that. Yes, the the country wasn't so thrilled with him. We hear Roach's side of the story, of course, but um, I do encourage people to go check out uh, Roberto Vizzantini's. It's, it's out there on the interwebs. It gives you the bigger picture of that complicated race. Roach also gets into the tour that year and, of course, Worlds. And he mixes his storytelling with his analysis, his one-of-a-kind ability, uh, his one-of-a-kind position to uh, look at what he did that year and to look at what's on deck uh, racing-wise, in the year ahead, and how that might play out for Tade Pogacar. So let's hear from Stephen Roach. Stephen Roach, welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. Thank you very much for having me on, Matt. It's a great opportunity to touch base with a lot of my old Canadian friends. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> maybe maybe Steve Bauer's listening. I know you uh, raced with him tons back in the day. Yeah, yeah. That feels like yesterday, you know, but I mean, I, I met Steve about two years ago again. I hadn't seen him in years. He hasn't changed. Still the same haircut. <laughs> but um, but uh, no, it's always, always great to meet up with these guys because, um, you know, I think um, even though today's generation of, of bike riders are brilliant, um, we had a great era as well back in the 80s and 90s. And um, we had some great battles uh, with all these riders together. So yes, of course, great, great memories. And it's, um, it's always great to be able to hit you up now and again and have a chat about not so much about old times, but how are we doing today? And we are going to talk a bit about old times and uh, how things are going today. As a bit of an introduction, you are one of only two male riders to achieve road cycling's triple crown. The Triple Crown is winning the Giro d'Italia, the Tour de France, and the World Championships in one year. You took your Triple Crown in 1987. Eddie Merckx scored his in 1974. And I should note that in 2022, Annemiek van Vleuten won the three equivalent women's events, which included the first edition of the Tour de France Femme in its latest incarnation. But Stephen, I want to look back at 1987 with you. But I also want to look ahead, too. The Giro is set to start in a little more than a week. Tadej Pogacar is on the start list. He's also planning to go to the Tour de France and Road Worlds in Zurich. He is such a strong rider. And with Worlds being a course for the puncher or classics type, the Triple Crown seems like a credible goal. So let's see what we can learn by comparing 1987 to today. At the start of 1987, did you think the Triple Crown was a possibility for you. 
Um, to be honest with you, um, no. Um, I was coming off the back of a, a knee injury and um, 86 wasn't a great year for me. So, of course, um, the good thing about it was because my season wasn't very good, I had no media or corporate dinners to go to in the fall of 86, which meant I had all my time to train and prepare for 87. And um, I always thought, like, after finishing third in the Tour in 85, I always thought, okay, well, I finished third. I, I know my first kind of major performance in, a, in the Grand Tour. So um, anything, anything is basically possible, meaning a Grand Tour could be possible. But going out and winning a, a Giro, a Tour, and the World Championships, and then doing it all in the same year, um, you know, that was wouldn't, wouldn't that not have been in my wildest dreams or anybody's wildest dreams, I think, because... Um, it was something that wasn't even thought about then. and um, But, okay, it hasn't been done since 87, but that doesn't mean that the riders haven't been there. There have been good riders that are capable of doing it, but you don't just need the riders um, to be capable of doing it. You also have to have the itinerary, the routes, the weather, the, your, your look, your team. Um, everything has to be going in your, in your favor to be able to achieve the, the triple. Before the Giro which began on May 21st of that year. How was your form? It was quite good, actually, because I had um, won like um, one or two races before that I'd won the Tour de Valencia in the early season. I had done a really good Paris Nice, but lost the last day because of a puncture. I finished second in Liège, Bastogne yeah, Liège, losing to Liège, uh, Marino Argentine, stupidly, um, because i um, uh, not paying attention to what was going on. I in a breakaway with Claude Criquillon. I didn't know that um, Argentina was coming from behind. No race radios in those days. And the final 200 meters, um, I was caught by Argentine and he pipped myself and Claudia on the line. So, um, But nevertheless, finished second. And then in the Tour of Romandy, I won two or three stages in the Tour of Romandy and went from that to the Giro. So I had really good form. And also my teammate, Roberto Vicentini, was also the outgoing winner. He was the winner of 86 Giro. So we had a very, very good uh, and very strong uh, career team. You mentioned Liège Baston Liège and uh, Moreno Argentine. He will come up again later in our discussion because he's there later in the year. Exactly. But um, what do you think of Pogacar's season so far? Remember, he's won Strada Bianchi in stellar fashion with an 80 kilometer solo ride, third at Milan San Remo, and he crushed the Volta at Catalunya. Um, I think he's, you know, he's uh, he's uh, an incredible rider. Whatever he does or doesn't do from now on, he's um he's definitely a rider of all terrain. Like he's um capable of winning the Grand Tours, capable of winning the one-day classic, sprinting, time trialing, mountains, descending, bad weather, hot weather. He's a very, very versatile rider. And um for his age, I mean he's an incredible class. But there are some incredible riders there now at the same age with uh Vinigard is also there, like there's a few guys there at the moment at that age that are doing extremely well. And I think um, Pogacar has um, has a great chance of, uh, of doing a triple this year, definitely. Do you think that he possibly has done too much before the Giro or maybe enough? Like, how do you feel about the, the volume he's done? You know, I think it's always, always very easy to say afterwards he did too much or didn't do enough or whatever. But I think going into it, he's a guy that knows what it takes to get the achievements. I think he's a little bit old fashioned, old style, old school, in that he listens to his body, but he goes out there and doesn't listen too much to the theory. Or sometimes maybe people say, oh, he can't do the Giro on tour anymore. You know, who says so? You know, uh, people say, oh, you can't perform at this high level in the Giro um, without doing so many races before. Um, but the guys today, are so well programmed. They're they're all the data they have from like years of cycling. Like I'm sure Bakacara's data has been stored for from the age he got out of nappies, maybe. But um, I'm sure the data has been stored, so these guys know exactly where they are. And if Bakacara is going to do the Giro and Tour, he knows where he is. He knows where he's going, and he knows it's also possible to do both. And I strongly believe it's possible. Even though I kind of endorse the fact that the guys say, oh, it's too hard. I say, great, good guys. As long as you guys avoid doing Giro and Tour, there'll be no more doubles or triples, you know, or triple <laughs> crown winners. 
So we keep believing in it. But in the back of my mind, it's great to see these guys participating in the Giro, then the Tour, and then, you know, this year the World Championships is also for a really, really good puncher. So this is probably the first year in a long time where we have the, the rider, riders and the, the, the route, um, both Giro, Tour and the World, um, which, which will suit one rider, which, is we, which, we, which will be um, Pocacar. I want to pick up on that idea of the data, which, as you said, probably goes back years and years for Pogacar and many uh, of the riders of the current generation. And also, you know, old-fashioned ideas of, of belief and willpower and, uh, you know, even tactics right in the road. Um, but today's events seem to be raced from kilometer zero, and that's in contrast to how uh, races were raced well, even before I've heard from riders, even before the pandemic, races were raced differently. How were races raced in 87? Um, of course, you could always, you know, go to a race and say, well, you know, I can no point in really, haven't got to really warm up because the first 20K or the first 30K or 50K will be piano, will be easy. Whereas today, they go from kilometer zero. But one major change is also the television. You know, for example, in our day, we used to kind of say, well, we know when the live television starts because the riders start attacking, which generally the final hour or the final two or three hours. But today, the television is there, live television is there from the very start. So this does, of course, encourage riders to go from the line to get the, you know, the, the bit of publicity for the, for the sponsors. Also animating the race and um, also executing team tactics, you know, trying to fulfill their, their their mission sometimes is to go from the line to prepare um the terrain for their leader who will take up the, the chase later on but um it's changed the television has changed a lot i think tactics because of the fact that um there's only one winner in these races there are only a couple of potential winners before the start so what does the rest of the the teams do they just sit there and and and, and take second place and um make the the, the trip the all the preparation for no television coverage. Whereas by having the television from the start and teams attacking from the start means that everybody's getting a bit of um, mileage out of it. Sponsors are getting a bit of television coverage out of it. The riders are making the race harder for the the, the, the leaders to take up the, 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 the race later on. So it's um it's all about the the different agenda today as from our day. Um, our day, the first two hours, nobody watched it. So what's the point in going up the road? Of course, when there was big, um, you know, big ultimatums uh, or big kind of team strategy going forward, that there was a climb uh, after 20K, 30K or something, we got to get a man up the road to be on the climb for the, the after 20K. Um, this can play, of course, um, an important factor into uh, whether the race goes uh, slow from the start or not. But nine times out of 10, the race was take off, uh, you know, fairly easy and then wind up uh, faster and faster as you go. I mean, we used to have breakaways like, getting like 10 minutes up sometimes and then have been caught towards the end, whereas that very rarely happens today. In 1986, as you mentioned, Roberto Vizentini, your teammate on Carrera, won the Giro. So going into 1987, the 1987 Giro, were you and he co-leaders after you had such a strong spring? Officially, yes, we were uh, co-leaders. Um, Roberto being, of course, the leader because he won the Giro in 86. And also he had uh, the history behind him, of uh, the credibility um, behind him uh, after winning a Grand Tour, where I finished third in the Tour in 85. 86 was an, a down season for me, me because of my knee injury. So I hadn't got the reference there as being a potential tour winner, yes, but um, Vizentini had done it. And we're back in Italy again, so there was every possibility that he could um, do it again. So yes, before the start, we were um, mutually uh, leaders, and the road was going to just decide who would be the, the final leader. The full story of the 1987 Giro is a complicated one. I've heard full podcasts dedicated to it. But let's hone in on one important stage. Stage 15 to Zapata. What was the situation before that stage? We, I had the jersey uh, early on in the Giro because um, I won the time trial down the Poggio. And as our team won the team time trial, I was the best 
um, of my team on GC. So um, I had the jersey. So the team were riding for me, and uh, Roberto was basically told to be stay free. So um, Roberto was, you know, a good guy, incredible class, and um, he followed me everywhere. So, of course, I didn't complain because at least I knew where he was. If I was in his shoes, I would have been trying to go up the road and brakes and just kind of kind of do a kind of a one-two on the competition. But um, Roberto saw differently. He was, a, he was a little bit afraid of me and he sat on my wheel all day. When when important brakes went away, he wasn't, didn't even try going with them until I moved. Then he moved after me. So I was a little bit kind of concerned about this because I felt, well, he wasn't playing his role um, correctly. But I thought, okay, I'm saying nothing because at least I know where he is rather than worrying about him going up the road, you know, <laughs> and all the Italians sitting on me and uh, finding myself then kind of played out. So, and then um, we came to the time trial in uh, San Marino, I think it was, and San Marino, yeah, and um, it was black and rain, very cold, so I went down and did my normal racky on the on the race route in the rain, and Roberto didn't do it on the bike because it was, uh, it was too cold, but he was hitting the car. And every few minutes, he kept coming along to me and asking me, Stefano, where's the wind coming from? Stefano, where's the rain coming from? Stefano, what gear are you riding? And normally, I'm in my bubble. I don't talk, I don't speak, I don't look at anybody. I go and do my recce. I am kind of, you know, registering in my mind the the, the road, the, the, the danger points, where I can gain time, where I can lose time, trying to elaborate in my mind what gearing I'm going to use, what tires I'm going to use, which wheels I'm going to use, which position I'm going to use. Um, because... In those days, we had like we had twelve gears, a six-speed block on the back. Whereas today, they've got like 11, 11, 12 speeds, and they've all kinds of ratios. So the ratio or the gears you have on board is not really important because you'll always have a gear to, to suit. Whereas in our day, we had to be very, very careful on the gearing we chose because the, the sprockets on the back are being changed every day to suit the rider and the terrain that we're going over. So very important um, factor. Anyway. I finished my racky. I'm having my, my my lunch three hours before my start. And Roberto comes and sits down beside me and starts at me again. Stefano, the wind, Stefano, the gearing, Stefano, the rain, Stefano, whatever. So it blew my brains. So basically when I went on the, the start ramp and came down the ramp, I knew it was going to be a long day because the legs just weren't there. I was just totally emptied. So that day, Roberto did, did, did the ride of his life. You know, we put two minutes into everybody and uh, basically um, annihilated everybody. And uh, on the finish line, then um, I came in, the jersey was taken off me, given to Roberto, and it was as if I didn't even exist. So I must say my pride was hurt a little bit <laughs> because um, I had been number one, I'd been the leader for so long, and then because it didn't perform at the time trial, it, it was as if nothing ever had happened before. So... Anyway, long story short, Roberto goes on the podium. He's been asked there on live television, Roberto, now we know who's the leader. Um, you've dominated this time trial. There's still one more time trial to come. Now you're the leader, but I'm sure Roach now will ride for you. And when you go to the tour, you will ride for him. And Roberto said, um, and honestly said, uh, yeah, Roach is going to ride for me now, but I'm not going to the tour. I'm going on holidays. So I thought, okay, that's quite honest of him, but at the same time, when is my payback, you know? Anyway, I was left sitting in my room and um, going through the road book with my teammate and, and roommate, um, Eddie Shippers, and we were saying, okay, well, Roberto has the jersey now, I can't attack him, but if I got away in a break, well, then Roberto hasn't got the ride or the career team haven't got the ride, but it's going to be complicated. There has to be certain conditions where I can get away maybe, but um, I cannot be seen to be attacking. So we're looking at the, the profile of the next days and we're saying, well, Roberto probably buried himself today in the time trial, planning tomorrow a kind of transition day in preparation for the next mountain stage. Say his 15th sap battle was a transition stage and the following day was the mountain stage. So um, we thought, okay, well, if this is the case, um, Roberto will be kind of expecting a kind of cushy ride tomorrow um, so he can recover after his incredible effort in the time trial and he can be once again on the attack the following day. So I just thought, well, okay, well, if something happened on this day, on this day, this transition day, um, it might kind of destabilize a little bit Roberto, and you never know. So going up, the team, the team orders were staying in the front, everybody, 
Um, there's a couple of descents here, a little bit dangerous. Um, be careful a group doesn't go away and just protect the, the, the pink jersey. That was that was brilliant. But um, the climb before Sapara, there was a long, long descent after it. And there was three guys, two or three guys in the front and nobody from Carrera. So, of course, it wasn't my job, my role to go into that breakaway. But at the same time, there was nobody from Carrera. So why not? But I couldn't kind of jump out of the group and go across to the break. That would have been seen to be attacking. There's no reason for it. So I just went to the front with Eddie, my teammate, and he pulled over on the top of the climb. And I went down the descent, like, without dead looking behind me. And knowing I was going very fast because there was, uh, I couldn't hear anybody close to me. And when I got to the bottom, I joined the breakaway group. But the peloton were like, you know, 35, 40 seconds behind me. But then I was saying, this is a big situation here now because it's a suicidal because now I'm in the front. I can't really ride. But then there's nobody dangerous here, so I should ride. But the if the riders uh, ride behind me, where they catch me, um, I have to be able to finish on the on the climb to stop at them. So it was a bit of a kind of a suicide mission. But um, after a few a while, and the car came up and said, Stephen, what are you doing? So I explained to them politely, I'm doing my 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 role of of teammate. I'm in the front for the for the team. That way, Roberto can rest, you know, uh, tranquil, easy behind. So um, they said, no, Stephen, don't understand. The, the 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 groups are in threes and fours behind. You went down at that descent so fast. There's um groups everywhere. So you have to you have to wait for Roberto. So I said, no, let the Bianchi's ride for Argentine or let the Panasonic ride for Miller but um, and Brooking, but the, the Carrera team shouldn't be riding behind me. So they said, Stephen, the whole Carrera team and Roberto are riding behind you. You better stop. So I said, okay, well, you tell Roberto to stop his ride, riding, let the other guys ride, or else when he catches me, I'm going to go again. It's war. So um, that was it anyway. War was declared. And... Um, they caught me on the final climb and I was really under really under pressure, but I knew that I couldn't really kind of, um, I couldn't fail now because um, I looked really bad, first of all, so after kind of declaring war. So um, Eddie stayed me over the climb and paced me as much as he could. And just going over the top, then he, I went to my own then because I, um, Eddie couldn't go any further. And I knew that um, Rominger was in front and he was kind of very close to on GC. So I buried myself down to the finish and um, didn't catch Rominger, but I think I pulled the jersey for five seconds from Rominger, I think, at the, on the finish line. And Roberto lost a few minutes. But um, it was an incredible, absolute incredible day. So what happened in terms of team dynamics internally after that? It got quite complicated, as you can imagine, especially <laughs> when the, the my, my main competition wasn't really from my own team, it was from the public as well, because the public wanted my skin. I had to have a motorbike, two motorbikes in front of me on the climbs with their, their boots out. The police had their boots out, um, keeping the people back because they wanted to hit me. And uh, they were taking rice in their mouth and a bit of wine. And as I came past, they were blowing it out of me. Um, so it became very, very complicated, very complicated. For the first few days especially, because um, nobody really knew my side of the story. Um, Roberto was moaning and crying to all his, his um, journalist friends in Italy, him being Italian, of course. So it made it very complicated for me. But um, nevertheless, I was just saying I've done nothing wrong. I basically went down the hill faster than the rest of the guys. Roberto was um, sitting in the back, just kind of waiting for it to happen. So he wasn't on his guard. That's not my fault. We were all told to be in the front. So... Um, you know, Roberto is playing the victim here, so um, it's uh, not my fault. So it got very complicated for a few days. Then things got a little better because the teammates also realized that, well, Roberto wasn't going to win the tour because I was riding very well. And that um, if they didn't kind of help me and we didn't win the tour, well, then there's no money for anybody. And at that time, you know, the, the prize money was quite important. So... um. Things kind of shaped up, but then they, they they helped me then as much as they could. They could, but um, the atmosphere in the team was uh, was quite quite um, quite intense. Now today, I can't imagine that kind of split or that kind of turmoil happening within a team, the kind that happened to Carrera in 1987. However, 
fractures or fissures do happen. I'm thinking of last year's Vuelta a España. Jumbo Visma, which is now Visma Lisa bike, didn't seem, you know, the well-oiled machine that it usually is. Uh, they won in the end with Seb Kuss, but, well, Primoz Rogalic has left that team. And I'm also thinking of Team Sky in 2018, where Garrett Thomas was riding better than Chris Froome. Garrett Thomas would go on to win that. But the team, as I understand it, wasn't going to back Thomas, even after he was shown to be going better. Um, I think they were hedging their bets with Froome like, longer than maybe they should have. That's all to say, do you think... UAE Team Emirates is immune or at least less likely to have divisions. I think that um, with um, Pogai Char, there's, um, there's a huge difference between himself and anybody else in, the, in that team. So I think that uh, they're, they're all their eggs be in the one basket, I think, going into the Giro this year and into the Tour again, because um, Pogai Char has shown on, on all fronts that he's capable of, he's already won a Tour, but I mean, he's capable of winning the Tour, any Tour, and um, I think that um, I cannot see any any friction in that team at all uh, for the Giro. I agree with you. And I was I was looking through the team lineups, thinking, you know, is there any possible friction? The only thing, and this is maybe a stretch, but there's Joe Almeida. He's he won a stage at the Giro last year. Was third in the GC. Uh, actually, in 2020, he led the Giro for 15 stages, but at the moment, he doesn't seem to be on the start list for the Giro. It looks like he'll be working for Pogacar at the Tour. So maybe, maybe, this is all super conjecture right now, the team is just making sure uh, everybody's clear as to who's riding for what. Yeah, but I think that um, like the, the UAE team have not got the strength and depth to put out two massively massive number one teams for Giro and the Tour. I think they have kind of a, a one A B team for the um, for the for the Giro and the one A team for the for the for the tour. I think they've kept a lot of their, their good artillery for the for the tour because that's that's the big one that counts. If Bakhtar doesn't win the Giro, okay, well it's 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 a pity but it's not a big big deal. Whereas the the one that everybody wants to win of course is the, the Tour de France. So uh, and also I think maybe they could be a little bit afraid of uh, Vinny Gard because um, uh, if they go to the tour and you have Vinny Gard and you have Ivan Poul um, really firing on all eight cylinders, um, and imagine something happens to Pocket Chari is not of the great form he has or injury or an accident for something he doesn't win the tour. At least if he goes out now and wins the Giro, he would have won his big tour for the year. And whatever happens in the Tour de France, then they can take it, you know. So I think they're they're being strategically intelligent, uh, doing what they're doing, um, because um, independent of records or or wanting to do a double Giro Tour or a triple Giro Tour and World Championships, um, I think they are they are playing playing it safe, so that no matter what happens, they um, UAE will win uh, at least one Grand Tour this year. That is a good point. However. We will get on a little later to maybe analyzing how their safety plan is maybe changed based on uh, some of the racing that's happened this spring. But before we get to that, and even before we get to the 1987 Tour de France, I want to talk uh, more about the Giro Tour double. So yes, the Triple Crown is super rare, very rare, um, but winning the Giro and the Tour in the same year is also an amazing feat into itself. Only seven riders have done it. That's Fausto Coppi, Jacques Anquetil, Eddie Merckx, Bernardino, Miguel Indurain, Marco Pantani, and you. Since Pantani in 1998, and let's exclude Pogacar for this question, but between 98 and now, which riders in your mind have had the best chance of doing the double? I think. Um... Chris from yeah, probably in 2018. Yeah, yeah, um, Wiggins. But I always felt Wiggins would, would have been a little bit um, difficult in the Giro because of the the bad weather and the the very very extreme cold conditions in the Dolomites. But um, there 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 have been a few. But on the top of my head now, um, you know, uh, you know, of course Armstrong should have done it. You know, but um, he didn't do it. <laughs> 
he wasn't so interested, yeah. Yeah, you know, he he of course he like I'm saying, there are writers that are writers had the potential of doing it, but just the the, the things didn't stack up, you know, for, for them all. But um Armstrong could have done it definitely, yeah, definitely. And Alberto Contador won in twenty fifteen, the Giro, I should say. So he was definitely a contender. And Vincenzo Nibali, he won the tour in twenty fourteen, so he showed he could do that. And then the uh the year maybe that he might have been best poised, I think, is twenty sixteen with his with his second Giro win, actually. Yeah, he, Nibali was a good guy, okay, yes. But um I think he never was had the strongest team also. Mm. And uh, I think he he was uh, a one tour per year guy. He was really, really strong in one of the tours, one or the other. But um he always showed signs of fatigue when he rode a second tour. Speaking of fatigue, in nineteen eighty seven there were only eighteen days between the end of the Giro and the start of the tour. How was your recovery between those two Grand Tours? Well, as you can imagine, after all the hostilities in the Giro, I was quite um, quite dead uh, mentally and physically after my Giro. So my main thing was to um, hide away for the, the 18 days. No point in going out and riding the Midi Libra or any other events that were there on the calendar because I would have been pestered by journalists and um, I would have had to keep the same intensity of training or to be able to race at that level would have meant digging deep into my my energy again to keep the the form up to follow on from the Giro. So I felt okay. Well, forget about the racing. It's only eighteen days, so I'll recover from my Giro as best I can, and then just by riding, just gonna going out and taking my bike for a ride rather than going out training. Uh, as you can imagine, totally fatigued. Them. So uh, I thought, okay, well. The tour this that year was that also twenty six days long. It was four thousand three hundred kilometers. I think it was. I knew it was going to be a very very long tour. So mentally, it had to be very strong. So I thought, okay, well, I'm better off being eighty percent physically fit and a hundred percent mentally fit than being a hundred percent physically fit and eighty percent mentally fit. Thinking that, okay, well, when times get tough in the tour, it'd be the mental, the morale that will drive me through it. So I basically stayed behind and um, I wound down after my Giro and then I started doing motor pacing then, motor pacing then before the, a few days before the tour, just getting my bit of, bit of rhythm back up again because my my aim was also to, not for the, the competition, to think that, okay, Steven's done his Giro, he's, um, he's cooked. Uh, I also want to show that I was going to be, going to be, don't forget about me in the tour. It's not because I won the Giro and I was... Um, at a difficult Giro, that I'm not going to, you know, do well in the tour. I'm here to do well in the tour. So um, my I broke my 26-day tour up into a few days where I felt I had to be on the button. One was the prologue. Boom. Good performance in the prologue. That means shows everybody wrote his back. So I finished third in the prologue. Next one was the team time trial, where I won the team time trial. Next one was the individual time trial to Futuroscope, like the 87 or 90 kilometers long it was, and I won that. So then going to sit back and relax and see how the competition is doing and then plan a strategy going forward, which will be the first uh, mountain stage. So I plan my race going through like that. But the 18-day gap between Giro and Tour, I basically took things relatively easy for the first uh, week or so and before um, ramping it up then by doing some motor pacing and some specific training um, to be... No, I won't say on form for the prologue, but to be able to put in a good prologue. So uh, Pogacar has 34 days between the end of the uh, Giro and the beginning of the Tour. Um, he has it easy then compared to you. Oh, no problem. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but, you know, I think that like, you can't really compare our day and today because um, we managed everything ourselves, like our, our diet, our recovery, our food, the, the media... Uh, we had to manage everything ourselves. Where today, the the riders have the the poor riders today have um, a team around them to manage all of this. So um, it's unfortunate for the journalists, but it's much more um, relaxing for the, for the riders. So you know, having an ex- extra few days is good for them. Um, he will need a thirty four days or so to to recover because the Giro is a very very hard race. Also today, you know, they're, they're going harder. You might you might say the riders are going faster and harder and digging deeper. 
So, um, but then they're fitter and much more prepared as well physically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the nutrition is, we hear so many stories about how the nutrition is so dialed that, uh, and that's what's helping them um, achieve these uh, accomplishments. Everything, everything is the, 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 the data, the uh, nutrition, um, the, the, the training, whether they're dialed into their, their, their coaches uh, 24-7, um, analyzing the training they're doing, their, the, the, how the body reacts to this training, that training. They're, everything is all like nearly like a one-to-one -one with our coach. And they, they train, I won't say on a day-to-day -day basis, but their, 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 their training has been monitored and everything can be tweaked um, on a daily basis. So everything is fine-tuned. So um, um, everything's gone really, you know, performance, performance, performance. You mentioned key days throughout the 87 tour that you had targeted or that you had mapped out. But one stage that stands out above the rest, at least when people look back at that tour, is stage 21. It's a stage you neither won nor did it put you in the overall lead. But can you tell us why that stage was important? That was a, a Wednesday in July, stage 21, with uh, three significant climbs, the Galibier, the Telegraph, and the Madeleine. Finish in La Plania, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it was, um, I had, had the jersey um, two, two days before, I think it was, and um, the guy got, got her off me. And the guy had a really, really good, strong uh, team behind him, and he was a much better climber than I was also. So I, I was had to be very, very, you know, dialed in to what I was doing. And um, on this day, from Bourdoison to um, to La Plaine, there was like Galibier, Telegraph, Madeleine. And um, going up the, the Galibier, the Colombians kept attacking. So we um, when we got to the top of the Galibier, we went down the Galibier very, very fast because we thought, okay, well, if the Colombians, um, the Colombians weren't great descenders, so we thought, okay, well, we get rid of the Colombians going down. And that way, going up to Madeleine, we'll be, uh, we'll be, should be okay because they, they'll be, you know, behind chasing or they will be maybe a little bit tired maybe and they won't be as energetic on the, on the Madeleine as they were on the Galibier. Anyway, long story short, we get to the valley after the, after the Twin Telegraph and the Madeleine. There was a small group of riders with me, but the Gado had no teammates. So there was a few guys going up the road and a bit of a stall. So I thought, well, hmm, okay, a bit suicidal, but if I can get across to that group, right of the group on the Madeleine, down the far side, up La Plaine, um, if the Gado's teammates don't get back on quickly, I may be able to gain two or three minutes and maybe, you know, pull a minute out of them uh, and they finish. This, in my mind, was possible, but my main aim also was that when I analyzed the, 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 the tour profile, and at this stage, to analyze who my real competition was going to be coming from. And I realized that my main competition was going to be Delgado and jean Foster Bernard. I knew that Bernard in the mountains was okay. But I also knew then that in the final time trial, I could also put one minute approximately into Delgado on a good day. So I knew that if I could only be, be within one minute to Delgado, my tour could still be won. So... Um, Unfortunately, this day anyway, Delgado's teammates got together. They caught me just before hitting the foot of uh, La Plaine. They caught me. And um, so I'm kind of saying this is going to be a long, long day because I've been out there for 70 or 80 K. I, you know, used up all my, all my shots. What am I going to do? I was, you know, in a difficult situation. And of course, I'm kind of putting myself in Delgado's shoes. And I'm saying, well, if I'm Delgado, I would attack straight away. That way Roach doesn't recover. And um, and take it from there. So he, he actually attacked me. So I'm going to say to myself, well, if I go with him, uh, I'm going to burn myself up altogether. If I let him go, let him think he's winning and I'm beat. And then when I hold him at a certain distance, and then when I get to four or five K from the finish, just give it everything I have and try and come back to finish off as close as I can to him on the finish line. So it all, all sounds very easy when I'm kind of talking to you, but <laughs> quite quite difficult. To, um, you know, here I am, like, gonna, you know, hoping to win the tour. I'm after making an incredible effort, an incredible effort. I'm quite tired, and my main rival, Degado, catches me and attacks me straight away. So I'm kind of watching my tour chances, kind of going away from me. 
So I let them get 30, 40, 50, 60 seconds, one minute, 110, 115, 120. And at 120, I said, okay, I got to do something now. So I started accelerating a little bit. And um, I realized that I was holding about 120. And I wasn't actually giving my 100%. So I thought, okay, well, either he's happy with 120 or else he's kind of hopping out at this moment and he can't go any faster. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hold him at this. And with four or five K to go, I'll just bury myself. And in that way, there was no, there was no radio, um, ear, earphones or no personal radios, which meant that um, he was getting no kind of direct time checks except from the motorbikes, which sometimes weren't really reliable or from the public. So um, anyway, 4K came to go, came and I, I said, okay, now I got to go. So I started accelerating and um, I didn't really know how close I was getting to him because I had no radio either and the time checks were coming in from the people, but you can't really hear them because everybody's shouting and I couldn't see anybody because there were so many people on the, on the roads and I couldn't see up the hill. So I just buried myself and um, we came into the final kilometer and the, the, I always remember it, the, the road opened up and there was, because there was barriers, so no, no public on the, on the road. And um, I was with a guy called Dinny Roo, who was um, from, the, from the Z at the time, or Z, yeah. He was on my wheel and I just went from the small ring to the big ring. But because of the change in, in, uh, in gearing, my bike almost came to a stop. Then he rode, kind of rode past me, looking down at me, saying, Stephen, what are you doing here? You know, <laughs> what are you doing here? Putting the big ring up. So um, I got onto the big ring. I just wound it up and wound it and wound it and wound it up. Came around the final corner, and there was um, the red car of Jacques Godet, the race director, in front of me, and Delgado just in front of him. And I, I think I, I lost. I didn't lose. I, I only lost uh, four seconds, but I pulled back like one minute and 20 seconds in the final 4K. So the guy didn't know I was coming. I didn't know he was there. And that's the beauty about not having the race radios at the time. But um, that was a day, like I said, I, I, I didn't win, didn't lose. But that was a day I could have lost the tour. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It really did. It even shocked um, Phil Liggett, uh, who was calling yeah. the race. And there's that famous, uh, his famous patter there when uh, he's surprised to see you as well. Exactly. Yeah, the Roach, is that Roach? It's Stephen Roach, it's Roach, yeah. No, incredible, incredible um, commentary, live commentary from from Philly. Yeah, incredible. And so, stage twenty one is a dramatic stage, and people tend to glom onto that to focus on that. But um, as they do, is there anything else that they might miss that is important to your tour victory? Well, um, after the stage, I was taken to hospital and um, basically checked up, and I was sent home uh, fit for work. <laughs> <laughs> as they say but I'm kind of you know my, my, my mind is still in the race uh, um, like Delgado and everybody has seen me um, taking away in a stretcher they'll be motivating themselves now saying to themselves well you know, tomorrow is another day hard day the following day was um, I think there was another four or five climbs and up uh, finishing up uh, called the uh, Jouplan down into Morzine so a very hard climb so I'm saying to myself well you know these guys are going to be kind of you know having it in the mind that, okay, well, tomorrow there's no way this guy is going to recover. So I'm saying to myself, well, you know, my strategy is I, I um, my, my, my master came to my room and said, Stephen, I'll bring you up your dinner. So I said, no, 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 uh, Silvano, I will come down for dinner. I said, I'll get down to dinner. And at that time we were those five, six teams all in the same hotel in a big um, uh, salon all eating together. So I'm saying I'm going to walk into that room and just see their face and everybody. I'm walking into the room and everyone's saying, oh, Stephen, great day today. Um, pity tomorrow's a hard day, but whatever happens from now on, your day today was an epic day. It was amazing. Well done. And in my mind, I'm saying, you wait and see tomorrow. Because my mind was that Delgado saw me taken to hospital today. If tomorrow I can fight him tomorrow, if I can even put one second into the guy, how is he going to sleep before the time trial two days later? thinking this guy was taking the hospital. Next day he comes out and puts a second into me. So this guy is superhuman. I'm not going to beat this guy in the time trial. That was my whole game was to, you know, play on the on the nerves and the and the um and the uh the, the motivation and morale of uh of of the others. And in fact uh, the following day I uh, um tried attacking a few times going up the final climb and um couldn't get away because 
at this stage also, like Tagado was Spanish and there were other Spanish writers in the tour. And all of a sudden, because it's the last closing few days, a lot of kind of alliances are formed, you know? So no matter when I attacked, there was always a Spanish guy chasing me down. <laughs> so, um, so I couldn't get away. So going over the top of the of the Jew plan, the 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 plan B was um, ultimately if we can't get a get away going up, well then we just um attack under the sands going down into uh, Morzin. So um same as they, as they did in uh in uh, in Italy and um uh, the stage in the Sapada. So um I got away and like there are certain days in your career where you do the descending and everything goes like you know it's, it's kind of everything is in harmony the bike the man the machine everything was just, just one an incredible descent and um I think I put like 18 seconds into Pedro on the descent and um for me that was um nailing the coffin for for Pedro um showing him that yesterday I was taken away <laughs> In the stretcher, and today I'm putting 18 seconds into him. You wait to see the time trial. That was my um, my, um, my my tactic. I kind of love that, and it, it takes us again beyond data that we were talking about earlier. Uh, there's there's so much more to racing than numbers, and the uh, the psychology is uh, a key factor in all of that. Yeah, actually, I did a podcast a few weeks ago for um, uh, Jens Voigt and Bobby Judich. Uh, and their podcast normally was quite short, and they ended up being double the time. But they were saying there was that um, listening to this kind of stuff, even them being pro riders themselves, um, different generation, but they they weren't um, they weren't in as as in depth into tactics as we would have been in our generation, because their generation had the the, the race radio, and they were getting the orders from the team car. They hadn't got to do all the thinking. For themselves, but you know, I'm I'm sure now today that a lot of the, the younger writers are a little bit old school, and they have a they have um, a little bit more kind of I won't say ambition because the, these writers in the past never never lacked ambition, but it's just an, an attitude maybe that uh, we had, and some of these writers like Pogacar, like uh, Vinigar, these guys have attitude, and they've shown it already, and I think it's going to make for great racing. At this year's. It's really a Basque Country stage race. On stage four, there was a major crash that seriously affected Remco Evenepoel, Primoz Roglic, Jonas Vingegaard, and many others. The three riders I just mentioned were supposed to take on this year's tour. It's still hard to say how the crash will affect these riders ultimately by the time July rolls around. Actually, by the time uh, June 29th rolls around, which is when the tour starts this year. Around two weeks after the crash, Roglic was training once again. Evenepoel was only riding the trainer a bit. For Vingigo, who had a collapsed lung after that accident, it took almost two weeks before he left the hospital. What I have to say next is maybe cold, maybe a cruel question, but does that crash in the Basque Country make Pogacar's Giro Tour double more likely? You know, I think it's... um. These are the kind of the, the events of our, of the risk of the job, and um, these things happen. But yes, definitely, definitely it does. But hoping that he doesn't fall in years past only this weekend. You know, it's um, it's very unfortunate. You know, um, you gotta you 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 make the racing with the cards you have in your hand. You know, at the time, and uh, with the riders that are there with you. So um, but I think that um. It's uh, making things a little bit easier for him, definitely, yeah. Back to 87. What was your assessment of the Rhodes World Course in Villach, Austria, before that event on September 6th? The, 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 road, the race road, route in, uh, in Austria was um, being promoted as being a flat event um, for sprinters. So once again, of course, I wasn't the greatest sprinter, so why should I even think about winning it? But of course, we had Sean Kelly, and my Irish teammate, who was, um, you know, had already done his proof in uh, in Goodwood and in Chambéry with his um, with uh, with medals. So um, he uh, he was quite capable of winning a World Championships. You know, we 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 arrived two days two days before it, and I'd ridden some races in Italy before it to fine tune my my um my condition. We'd also ridden some. Uh, criteriums in Ireland, in Dublin, Cork, and Wexford, with myself, Sean Kelly, Paul Kimmage, and Martin Early. 
And uh, we had some you know, incredible performances and some incredible uh, achievements in that we we won all the races in uh, in Ireland um, by making a small little mafia between ourselves against the, the bridge riders, bridge pros. And of course, it wasn't an easy task, but we had some great fun and it really brought the team together. And, um, you know, rather than going to restaurants after the finishes, we were having like, you know, fish and chips in the corridor of the hotel, you know, um, you know, joking about the, the event. But it was um, at the time very trivial maybe, but it um, brought us together and made us, um, you know, really, really kind of welded us together as a team before going to the world. So um, when we got to the world, then I went out on the, on the world circuit uh, two days before it. And I thought, gee, this is for no sprinter. I mean, okay. You go around this uh, circuit once, a sprinter might be able to win it, okay? But going around like 22 times, there's two climbs every every uh, every lap. Um, it's going to be a wearing down process. So maybe this could be for me, maybe, you know? Um, but the weather was very, very hot. So after, you know, the, the accumulated fatigue from the Giro and the Tour, I wasn't in, the, in, in great shape uh, that way. But I wanted to be there to try and help Sean Kelly um, win a medal. The morning of the World Championships, open the window, lashing rain, like seven, eight degrees and really, really bad weather. So I'm saying, hmm, this could be my day, you know. <laughs> so um, that was probably, you know, I really kind of hit home then that um, um, this, if it had been hot uh, with the accumulated fatigue from the Giro and the Tour, would have been complicated for me because the hot weather didn't really, you know, didn't really appreciate it. And, um, but because it was cold, was very refreshing for me. So it left my options um, open to me. So um, the race went on, then developed, and then, and then in the final, the, the, the rain eased off, and I found myself there with Sean and Martin Early and Paul Kimmage and uh, Alan McCormack, the, our, our other Irish um, competitors. They did, did a great job to try and keep things together for, uh, for the race. And then uh, in the end, I just took over with Sean, and we, we both rode an incredible final. And, you know, I was lucky in the end to be able to get away and extremely lucky in the, in the end to be able to um to, to win a sprint, which I never won many sprints, but I tactically, tactically won that sprint by by surprising people and going up the inside. But um of course I had to have the legs as well. So I was lucky, but nevertheless I had the legs as well. Could you tell me a bit more about the team tactics in the finale? Because you were ahead with a group, um I think it was a total of five. And Kelly, your teammate, and here's this name again from earlier, Moreno Argentine, were behind. Now, Argentine uh, had won the previous year. Now, I believe Argentine was um, trying to, uh, you know, cajole, badger, and what have you, your teammate, into to working to, to catch the group that you were in. Well, I had I'd covered all the groups in the final two laps, and um, when the group split, uh, Sean missed the split, and I rode across with Sean to get into the breakaway group. And once we got into the breakaway group, I, I made sure that for the last lap, we stayed together. And um, with about 5K to go, I thought, well, okay, well, if I, um, I want to be able to give Sean a good lead out, I better just go to the back and recuperate a little bit. So when I sat on the back, um, Ralph Sorensen and Ralph Golds um, picked off the front and nobody went after them. So I said, okay, well... <laughs> Here we are. We've done all this work, and there's a group gone away. So I jumped from where I was and got across and into that group. When we came into the final uh, 2K, Sean was behind with Argentine. So, of course, Sean couldn't ride, wouldn't ride because I'm in the front, and Argentine wouldn't ride because Kelly was there. And we also knew that Argentine in a sprint with Kelly, it was, you know, it was very, very iffy who might win. So, um, I kind of said, okay, this is another fine mess I've got myself into because I'm I'm the I'm the slowest sprinter of, of all these guys, you know. We, we jokingly we say, well, you know, I, I kind of googled help right away, and uh, I was given a plan. <laughs> so um, I, uh, you know, the the um, we came around the the final left hand corner about five hundred meters to go, and um, the wind was coming from the right. So of course the sprinters in the front were like, like Ralph Sorensen and Ralph Golds. They were very good sprinters, so I knew they're gonna. With Twin Van Vliet, they're going to be watching each other. So I thought, okay, well, if I can surprise them a little bit, get a bit of a gap, who knows? But I got to get hit them by surprise. So by going into the right, I had a guy on my wheels. So I thought, okay, if I go on the right, Winterberger on my wheel, he's going to come off my wheel. He's going to beat me. 
how can I how can I lose them? So once again, I googled help, and uh, I was all, all of a sudden I was um, uh, sent down the left hand side of the group and uh, along the barriers, and um, there was a small 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 gap there. I got through the gap. As the gap was closing, Winter Winterberg, I couldn't get through the gap, so it meant I got a little bit of, bit of a gap myself, and. Um, they looked at each other for a couple of seconds and I'm riding away from them. I got the smallest of gaps and um kept the momentum going and uh and, and won by a couple of couple of couple of lengths, you know. And um the group this group then was followed up then by Argentine and uh and Kelly. Kelly finished fourth, I think, or fifth. Fifth. But um, you know, uh it was an incredible achievement by by Sean, but uh, you know, it was an incredible achievement by by our, our Irish team. It was. I was just wondering though, was was it more Kelly who was the marked man than you were? Were were people in general thinking he was the guy for for Team Ireland, and therefore maybe they paid a little more attention to him than you? Well, the thing was, I had ridden all day for Sean. Every break that went away, I was riding after it, so everyone knew I was there, and I was on form. I just won the Giro, won the Tour, so they knew I was really really on form. But what happened was in the final, then when I'm in the front. And Sean's behind with Argentine. Argentine knew, well, if I ride here, Kelly's going to beat me. So they hesitated. And during this time, I'm going away in the front group. Um, the fact that Kelly was there, of course, helped me a little bit. But like I had done so much riding before that. This is why, you know, looking back at it after all this time, I can say, like, you know, I was, I was a deserving winner of it because I rode so hard for, for Sean that day and for the Irish colours. That um, okay, it would have been great if Sean won. It would have been a fairy tale for Sean to win because he never won the World Championships. But then, um, by me winning it after riding the way I rode for for Sean, um, I was I was you know I can probably safely say and modestly say maybe that I was I was a deserving winner. Looking to today and uh, what might happen in Zurich, um, I'm just trying to think if there's any parallels or or things. That, um, but it's so hard with world championships races because they're so um, dependent on the course itself. But like, Pogacar is the standout person from Slovenia. However, he does, and we don't know the composition yet of the world's team, but he has fellow countrymen, Matej Mohoric, Primoz Roglic, um, even Jan Tratnik. <sighs> Would they, do they have the firepower to, uh, in a in a similar way to Team Ireland back in the day. Well, we don't we don't need um, an incredibly strong team. Um, like Bocacar is going to be he's going to be a marked man anyway. Um, and the other riders, the French, the Italians, the Belgians, they all know that what firepower he has and what firepower he can depend on. And they are going. They're not going. These big teams aren't going to let. Um, Groups get away, or they'll do the riding for them. The same as myself and the Irish team did in our day. We 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 had to make make use of the bigger teams, and the bigger teams know well. We if we wait on Team Ireland to do the chasing, we could be left here all day. So we can't afford to take that risk. So it's basically everyone. Everybody understands who's who and what's what, and what we must do. So not having a a strong strong team is not going to be a a major obstacle. No. Interesting, interesting. Have you ever discussed with Eddie Merckx the rare accomplishment that both of you share? Um, we've both spoken about it uh, individually, as individuals, but we never actually spoke together um, about it, now that you mention it. Um, there's always, you know, a certain respect there, but we never actually spoke about it. We've been to receptions together, we've been on different meetings together, but now that you mention it, never actually spoke about it, no. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the looks back to your racing. And also, thank you for your analysis of uh, what could be in the year ahead. Um, yeah, again, thank you. And uh, it was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much. And that's the episode. It is written and edited by me, Matthew Piero. I had help from Matt Hansen. Thank you, Matt. Can I get my Carrera jacket back? You can get your 
Carrera jacket back. You know, you know, I didn't really pay much attention to it like your FTP. I don't really pay attention to that. All right. Well, I guess I need to print more. <laughs> Please, no. Save the trees. Also, thanks to Terry McCall for his help. This episode of the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast is produced by Adam Killick, and he also does the music. Thanks also to Ontario Creates for its support. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please ride safe, and we'll talk to you later. <laughs>